the opinion polls said that Biden had this in the bag. Uh, he was going to win. And there was no question about it. Um, they did the same thing last time with Hillary Clinton. Both times they got it um, really wrong. Um, because what they've done is ignored the real situation on the ground, on the one hand. They've misread the mood amongst a certain layer of the population. And also what they don't understand is that um, when there's no fundamental difference on the key issues facing ordinary working class people, then you're gonna get the analysis wrong. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, uh, uh, liberal type issues involved, whereas there's a large part of the population which is suffering on the economic front and you lose sight of that and you will lose sight of the real process that's taking place. And it's not just the working class, there's different layers of society. There's also the middle classes are feeling the effect of this crisis. And unless you give a clear alternative to the left that takes up the issues facing working class people, the vote can go to the left and to the right, or to be more correct, I got that wrong. There's no left here. It can go to the Democrats or to the Republicans who are two bourgeois parties. Now, the latest figures indicate that Mike Biden might just clinch it. He might. It's looking more likely, let's put it that way. But it's still a very close run thing. And I wouldn't uh, bet, I wouldn't bet my uh, money, which is not very much, on um, the final outcome. What we have um, is a candidate of the bourgeois against a candidate of the bourgeois. Uh, we have the candidate of the establishment, who is Biden. And what's amazing is that uh, here we have the candidate of the establishment and all the so-called left lining up behind the establishment candidate against the other candidate, who uh, a, section, a section of the bourgeois do back him, although not the majority of the main uh, top ruling class. Um, now, what we have is a major, it's a constitutional crisis that's erupted in America. All the institutions actually are, are slowly being exposed, the Supreme Court, um, the presidency itself. And it's a very dangerous thing for the bourgeois to have exposed in public all these divisions and all these shenanigans at the top you know the people at the top are fighting each other and it's a classic if you leave that to go on for long enough then the cracks in the system are going to open up and at some point the masses are going to start coming through those cracks and widening them even even further now the events in the united states more than one commentator has made this and i think Several countries, I was looking at the press last night on TV, the Russian, the Chinese, they're having a nice, they're having a, a bit of fun with what's going on, you know, uh, saying this is the consequences of this system and uh, the, blah, blah, um, comparing United States to some uh, underdeveloped country. And there are actually some similarities. I mean, the sitting president refuses to go, even if the, the vote is against him. We saw that in many, many countries across Africa. And uh, that provoked huge turmoil and movements in those countries. We have them going to the courts to challenge the validity of the votes. We have people chanting, stop the vote, stop the count, in what is supposed to be a country which teaches everybody else about democracy, bourgeois democracy. You have these people, some of them turning up with guns at the polling station saying, stop the count. Um, not exactly how bourgeois democracy is supposed to work. Um, now, there is a growing fear of the serious bourgeois that um, there could be protests and counter protests, growing instability. All of this underlines something we've been highlighting for a long time the deep crisis of US capitalism which is part of the global crisis. The, the global crisis is really now concentrating on the key imperialist country um, in the world, which is the United States. 
and it's a reflection of the unstable world that we live in. Now, some people have, making, have been highlighting the fact that the American Democrat, dem, democracy is not really very democratic. Um, we could uh, acknowledge that in the sense that it's not the will of the American people that decides the president, because last time the majority of the Americans voted for Clinton, not uh, Trump, but they got Trump. Uh, this time we shall see, even if Trump were to clinch it, it looks likely that he still wouldn't have a majority vote. And then people, of course, will turn around and say, oh, the Americans, oh, they're all reactionaries. Not true. Even with a bigger turnout, you know, now there's something like 65%, which is considered high in America. Uh, usually it's 50, 55%. And, you know, nearly half the population didn't bother voting and they had good reasons to. I mean, when you've got two choices, which are basically uh, this fundamentally the same, they, they're both bourgeois parties, offering working people very little, there's not much incentive to go out. Now the situation is getting more polarized and more people have turned up. 65%. Now the guy that's going to win this election will win by winning just a little bit over 50% of the vote. 50% of 65 is like 32, 33% of the electorate will decide who the president of the United States is, shows you how unrepresentative this system really is. The reason it's unrepresentative is because there's no genuine voice of the working class uh, in this election. Um, another uh, thing that explains what's going on is there's general mistrust of the establishment. The fact that Trump can get away with some of the incredible things that he says is because there's a mistrust of the people at the top. You see, the same people who are talking about democracy and the rule of law and all this stuff are the people who govern over a system which bombs half the planet to pieces, which uh, has a police force which kills uh, people uh, kills blacks uh, for no reason, um, a system which governs over incredible social injustice. Uh, and this is the establishment that's doing that. The same establishment that is doing that is appealing for democracy and patience. And then Biden comes on and says, I'm going to be the president of all the Americans. Really, really, you're going to be the president of the unemployed and of the multi-billionaires. Yes, we will, we will see how that one pans out. Now, um, Biden is the candidate, was the candidate of the establishment. The Economist had a title. Uh, it said, why it has to be Biden. Um, question, when in a journal like The Economist, which in all the years that I've read it, I've not noticed any kind of leaning towards an extreme left-wing position on the part of The Economist. It's a, it's a very conservative journal and it reflects the views of a section of basically the British ruling class. When have they ever been a friend of the working class? When have they been on the side of the poor? And yet you have this unholy alliance of the lefts, the liberals, all these people and The Economist, and it's not just The Economist, The New York Times, they had an opinion column on the 6th of October by the editorial board, and, the, and they weren't messing around. The title was Elect Joe Biden America, and below it, the former vice president is the leader our nation needs now. Why is why are they doing that? Well, in the, in the uh, editorial, they said the country is weaker, angrier, less hopeful, and more divided than it was four years ago. And then it, on Biden, so his focus would be on healing divisions and rallying the nation around shared values. Shared values. Mm -hmm. The racists and the victims of the racists clearly have shared values. The poor at the bottom of American society share values with the billionaires. I'm going to give some figures in a minute on that. Um, Biden has um, said that he would be the president of all Americans. Now, let, let, let's look at the reality. Well, 27.5 million Americans still have no medical coverage. Um, half of US citizens depend on private medical insurance. 
um, and far more is spent on private care than any other industrialized country in the world. There are between 40 and 60,000 preventable deaths, deaths every year due to the lack of medical cover. This is the richest, most powerful country in the world has this situation going on every year. Clearly those people that die from preventable um, causes have shared the values with the multi-billionaire um, uh, pharmaceutical industry. Um, Americans pay four times as much for medicines as people in other industrialized countries. Operations cost two to four times what it costs in other industrialized countries. Healthcare is a money-making machine at the expense of the poor and the working class. There are half a million homeless people in, uh, in America. 38.1 million people living in poverty. One in six children living in poverty. But these figures are even higher if you look at the black uh, population, the Latinos and Native Americans. Um, in 2018, over 11% of US households were classified as being food insecure, not enough food on the table for the kids, clearly sharing values with the rest of the population. Um, and that makes over 14 million households in that situation. Unemployment. In March, it was just over 4%. It leaped to close to 15% uh, during the worst of the pandemic. It has somewhat come down, but it's still double what it was in March. It's around 8%. And up to the middle of August, uh, sorry, middle of October, every week for six weeks, there were over 800,000 new claims for some form of unemployment benefit. Um, and at the moment, over 25 million are receiving some kind of unemployment benefit. So we have growing poverty. Not, it's not been going down. The poverty has been increased over the recent period at one end of society and, in a, and a disgusting spectacle of an accumulation of immense wealth at the other end. Since, the, uh, since 2000, this has increased. This has been going on since the 70s, actually, but since 2000, it has increased. And not just the poor, the middle income layer have also stagnated. And that's a significant element in understanding what's going on because the the feel good you know we're Amer in america everybody you know, standard of living the middle class all the rest of that that has been whittled away over the years and that explains the instability that we have i mean in the meantime america's 400 richest individuals have a total sum of wealth of 3.2 trillion dollars that went up this year, that is during the pandemic, by $240 billion. Um, if you consider that um, overall US uh, GDP is 22.3 trillion, and if you look at another figure, the top 1% of American society has a, an overall wealth of $34.2 trillion. Uh, that's over 30% of the total wealth. That's far bigger than the public debt. In America, you could cancel the debt just like that tomorrow morning by taking $27 trillion of that $34 trillion and paying off the debt. And then you could say, I can be the president of, well, not all the Americans, but I could be the president of the 99%. I think that's, that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Then you could say that there is something, these people, these, the 99% have something in common they don't have anything in common with that 1%. The wealth gap has increased massively um, in the recent period. Um, and the bottom 50% of the population have $2.1 trillion. And that um, has actually gone down even further in the last 30 years. Therefore, Biden's promise to be the president of all Americans rings very hollow indeed. Would he change this? That's the question. Well, he didn't fundamentally change under Obama, who had a, a few years to work at it. Um, he, he could have, he could have, he could have uh, at least pushed this in the other direction. No, that process con continued under Obama, and Biden happened to be the vice president when that was happening. So it reminds me of the, the famous quote from Gore Vidal when you look at the American system. There is only one party in the United States, the property party. 
and it has two right wings, the Republicans and the Democrats. That explains the impasse, that explains the 50-50 breakdown of the vote. Um, and then of course, ah, then you have Kamala Harris, the vice president. She's got a lot of things going for her. Well, she's a woman, oh, she's black. So that, uh, that puts her up there and, uh, you know, she's gonna, she's gonna represent women America. She's going to represent those women who can't put food on the table for their kids. She's going to represent the blacks who are, you know, the black people who are being shot at or living in poverty. Oh yeah, absolutely. You can count on Kamala Harris doing that for these people. Um, the New York Times uh, referred to her as somebody who could appeal to both progressives and moderates, you see. And um, apparently, uh, uh, be moving left, or things like gay marriage and the death penalty. But uh, on other questions, I don't notice such a, sh a left shift. She was recently interviewed on TV, on one of the TV channels, and the interviewer asked her whether her opinions were of a socialist, whether she had a socialist or progressive perspective. You know what her answer was? She burst out laughing at that question. And um, and said, no, of course, that really brings home where they stand. Now, Biden and Trump are like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. And as I said, it explains the result. The laws of probability say that if you have two things that are very similar and you ask millions and billions of people to choose between them, it's going to fall somewhere very close to 50%. And then it's just a chance of a slight shift here and there will decide who. Um, and that's exactly what we're seeing. What America needs is a third workers' party. Um, there are working class people on both sides of the present divide. That's the tragedy. There are working class people voting for Trump, and Trump has skillfully tapped into that, saying that you know Biden represents the establishment. And it's true; <laughs> he does represent the establishment. He represents the bosses, the rich. Well, the fact that uh, Trump is also rich and a boss and a capitalist—that's a little detail, but but that he prefers to ignore. But there are working class people voting for him. There's also working class people significantly voting uh, for, for the Democrats. Basically, people are voting more against what they don't want rather than a clear alternative of what they do want. Um, still, and there's still about a third of the population didn't vote for anybody because they can't see who they could really vote for. Who's responsible for this at this moment, I would say, is Bernie Sanders who raised the hopes of millions of people with his talk about socialism and reform and all the rest of it. He could have offered an alternative, but no, 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 can't do that because we'd let Trump in, we'd divide the vote and the Democrats, all the rest of it. Opinion polls showed in the recent years that Stan Sanders as an independent candidate was probably the only one that could have defeated Trump. And the reason for that is he's the only one with the questions that he was raising that could cut into that working class vote that's going to Trump. The other people who are responsible, the trade union leaders, who have put everything, have done everything in their power to stop any kind of shift towards an independent workers' party in America. And then we have this idea of lesser evilism. You see, you see, Marxists are unrealistic. You talk about theory and long-term perspectives. You've got to do something practical. You've got to do something for today. You know, the, think of the, the situation we have today. And the way it's presented is basically Trump is a fascist, or, you know, he's a fascist regime. I, I like to remind people that um, you cannot meet and have meetings. You cannot publish articles. You cannot express your opinion if there's a fascist regime. Italy had a fascist regime for 20 years. Germany had a Nazi regime. Ask the Chileans who lived under Pinochet. That is a fascist regime. This is not fascism. Yes, it's not very democratic. Yes, there's elements of Bonapartism. Yes, Trump tries to uh, govern against all the, all the established rules of so-called bourgeois democracy. But it's not a fascist regime. And are we saying that if Biden were to win, We've liberated the United States from a fascist regime, and now we can live happily ever after under democracy. It just doesn't make sense that the fascists exist and are very dangerous. Yes, they do. They exist and they're armed in America. 
Nobody's under, under, uh, underplaying that. But how do you fight that? Do you fight that by voting in the guy who represents the establishment that actually prepared the conditions for the rise of Trump. It's this American establishment, which is policies, which created the Trump phenomenon. And you're saying that's who we should support. It just does not make sense. Um, um, the, uh, the policy of revolutionary Marxists, however, even it, it, with the rise of, of Hitler, was the correct position, oh, we must support the so-called progressive bourgeois of Germany against Hitler, when the, American, the German bourgeois were actually supporting Hitler. It just doesn't make sense. What was needed was a united front of the workers' organizations on a revolutionary program to overthrow um, capitalism. Trump is very much like Berlusconi back in 94, uh, 26 years since then. And then they were talking about a fascist regime, a fascist regime in Italy. Well, 26 years, and I still don't see uh, fascism. All this is propaganda to justify backing Biden, i.e. you don't back Biden, you support the fascists, you support Trump, um, all, all this kind of stuff. Um, but um, the, 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 it just doesn't make sense. Um, now, the truth is, as I said before, people don't trust the establishment. The middle layers cannot be won by Biden's politics. That layer of the American working class and the middle class who are backing Trump because they feel the, the economic distress of the, of, the, of, the, of the recent period are not going to be won over by a candidate of the bourgeois who is offering the same old policies as before. You want to win over the small businesses? Well, you've got to say to them, we want to help you with cheap credits, low interest rates. To achieve that, we have to nationalize the American banks, centralize them into one central national bank. We have to take over that wealth, which I referred to before, the wealth is there. That means you have to have an anti-capitalist, anti-establishment, anti-bourgeois uh, policy um, to, to reach these people. So what is required is an independent working class policy. Um, the fact that some local union, uh, lo uh, union locals have raised the idea of strike action if Trump refused to recognize the outcome of the vote, that is if he lost, that's an indication of where we should be going, i.e. independent working class action. That's whether that materializes into strikes or not, we will see, but the fact that it's starting to be raised is an indicator, it's the music of the future of the United States. The movement of the Black Lives Matter, which mobilized a mass of youth against this injustice of police killings of black people. That's also the music of the future. US society is divided along class lines and that division is getting deeper and wider. Now, why does the ruling class want Biden in? So they can have a president who claims he's anti-racist but will do nothing to stop the police brutality. A president who will, he will smile at the working class. He'll say it in a nice, calm voice, civilized, while he sticks the knife into the working class at the same time. They want somebody who they think can more easily get away with carrying out the policies of the bourgeois, who will work towards appeasing certain layers and trying to calm things down. The bourgeois are desperate to establish some kind of stability, but that stability is gone. And the reason for it is not the harsh words of Trump, it's the harsh reality of the class division and the economic um, situation in, uh, um, in the country. So what we need is an independent party of the working class based on a socialist program. As I said, public debt is an excuse that's used that we can't spend money on housing or social housing or welfare or care. $27 trillion of debt. I think if we took that from the $34 billion, a trillion dollars of wealth of the top 1%, there would still be $7 trillion left. I'm sure they could manage on that. Um, they can, they'd feed their kids uh, with that. It could so easily be solved. Some indications of the voting patterns. The youth between the ages of 18 and 29 massively voted against Trump. That's the layer where the vote against Trump was the biggest. 
However, even in the over 65s, it was about 50 50. The youth voting like that shows that, that it, it reflects the radicalization in the youth. The higher the normal turnout also indicates a wider layer of the population basically actively getting involved in politics in a certain sense and deciding that, yes, this time it's worth voting one way or the other. It's a very polarized uh, vote, but that's already the beginning of a process. It's the beginning of millions of people thinking about politics. When you start to think and ask questions, eventually you start to draw conclusions from your experience. But we also mustn't forget the class struggle in the United States. Let's not forget last year, General Motors saw its biggest strike in 49 years and the bosses had to make some concessions. If you look at the strike figures of the United States of 2017, 18, 19, it was a rising curve of, uh, of strikes across the United States. Um, and then if you look at 2020, we see a spate of strikes across the whole country, wildcat strikes, hundreds of them in food processing plants, meat processing, manufacturing industry, in transport, in healthcare, the Amazon workers in March, April, coming out on strike over the safety questions, similar to what we saw in many European countries. We had the teacher strikes of 2018-19 in West Virginia, in California, with the massive support of the students and the, and the parents. This is what was happening in America before the outbreak of the coronavirus. It's an indication of what is to come. Um, the youth vote, the movement around Black Lives Matter, all of this combined with the inevitable struggles of the working class as this crisis deepens, this will create the environment <clears throat> in, what, uh, in which eventually some kind of workers' organization, some kind of workers' party in one way or another will be created. And that will dramatically change the whole political situation in the United States. When you have Trump referring to socialism and communism so often, if it wasn't a danger, if there was no prospect of this getting any kind of popular support, why does he bang on about it all the time? Because he, he can see that it's, it, it is actually the alternative and the only thing which can actually cut across this, uh, this stalemate political situation. And when such a formation comes into being, the American Marxists will be ready to intervene with a clear uh, alternative um, to what we have at, uh, at the moment. Um, we shouldn't be, um, Marxists don't get depressed or don't get overexcited either. Marxists analyze what is happening why it's happening, uh, Trump could win. I'm sure a lot of people would be extremely depressed and desperate about that. He won't solve any of the problems. He will just create the conditions for further big movements and he would destabilize the system even further. If Biden wins, they will try and calm things down. Um, it doesn't look like Trump and his supporters are too keen on collaborating on that front, um, but it would continue the, um, the, um, the crisis of capitalism would continue. Whoever is in, that debt, which has massively increased, would continue to grow. And austerity at some point inevitably is the program that the bourgeois of America will have to impose. And that means coming up against the teachers that were on strike. It means going against the students. It means radicalizing further to the left, whole layers of American society and a future workers party could massively tap into that. And we have to explain that. And just one last thing before I sum up, this idea of lesser evilism. I've seen people who used to be Marxists or at least claim to be Marxists saying that this time we have to vote for Biden. We have to support Biden against Trump to stop the lesser evil. Uh, if Biden wins, and has four years in the present circumstances and carries out the economic program that the American bourgeois is demanding. You won't have avoided the lesser evil. Trump may be too old by then, don't know, or it might be him, he might come back. You could get somebody far worse than Trump. 
a far worse racist. I mean, I can't imagine far worse, but you, you there are, I be, believe you me, there are people who are even worse than that. They could emerge and they would attack Biden and Biden would lose. And you'd have an even worse scenario. Lesser, e lesser evilism does not stop the lesser evil. Even if it does temporarily, it creates the conditions for an even worse evil. It, ha it happened in Italy with Berlusconi. Berlusconi governed Italy three times. Every time the left said, we must support the soft sort of center left against him because he's the, he's the worst. Well, they, the left, the so-called left governed the country, privatized austerity, achieved far more for the capitalists than the, than the openly right-wing parties could do, and then handed the government back on a plate to Berlusconi, who could claim to be the man of the people. That's what would happen in America. So it's short-termism. It's not thinking ahead. This is not a moment to think, oh, we must do something now, otherwise, what can you do now? Is explain the perspectives, explain where society is going, and build a Marxist alternative and prepare to intervene with genuine revolutionary Marxist ideas as the whole of the American working class starts to get radicalized, enters into class struggle, strikes, protests, demonstrations, polarization of society left and right. In that reality, the only realistic policy is a revolutionary Marxist one.